On May 9, 2001, Dr. Greer presided over a press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Over 20 military, government, intelligence, and corporate witnesses presented compelling testimony regarding the existence of extraterrestrial life forms visiting the planet and the reverse engineering of the energy and propulsion systems of these crafts. Over one billion people heard of this press conference through the webcast and subsequent media coverage, including BBC, CNN, CNN Worldwide, Voice of America, Pravda, Chinese, and Latin American media. The webcast had 250,000 people waiting online. Dr. Greer has met with and provided briefings for senior members of government, military, and intelligence operations in the United States and around the world, including senior CIA officials, Joint Chiefs of Staff, White House staff, senior members of Congress and congressional committees, senior United Nations leadership and diplomats, and senior military officials in the United Kingdom and in Europe. For 20 years, Dr. Greer has been a leader in the process of disclosure. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Greer to X Conference 2007. You know, a lot of uh, conversation has happened, I'm sure, at this conference about are we alone in the universe? Why are they here? What are we to do about it? What are we to make of all this? And before I came in here, I was talking to a gentleman from Mexico and I said, you know, there's a wonderful saying, the world is as you are. And the reality is that the world has to become what our higher vision within us can perceive. We manifest this world, our civilization and everything in it is a result of our individual and collective consciousness, thought and action. And once we understand that and move in the direction of that good future, which awaits humanity, we will have an entirely new civilization on Earth. The reason it hasn't happened is that, sure, there's a cabal of people who enjoy all the geopolitical power that goes with a centralized economic, energy, transportation system. And it's this permanent government that, when I was doing a press conference with uh, Paul Hellyer, he was talking about, that, you know, there are two governments here. There's the government we elect and appoint, which usually to say it, couldn't find their ass in a well-lighted room with both hands, uh, <laughs> with a few notable exceptions. And then there's this permanent government. And that permanent government, or bureaucracy, at the top, there are two or three hundred people on a committee, and I've met with some of them, who basically enjoy being masters of the universe, or so they think. But as I said once to the head of Army Intelligence, you guys make your plan, but there's another plan. And there's a plan that's going to trump this plan of secrecy, domination, disinformation, fear-mongering, and war-mongering. And it's coming, so get ready, because it's going to happen. And to which he said, you may be right. In the meanwhile, we're running this show. The whole idea here is that there are folks who want to control the Earth and the Earth's people. And essentially, we're their vassals, and they like to be their masters. There's a thing called the school. Literally, that's all it's called, that they are sent to, so that they can learn to attain an adequate level of megalomania <laughs> to, step, it's true, to step into that role. And they are groomed along. It has nothing to do with whether someone is the president of the United States or not. Some have known, some have not. Some have known a little, some have been told nothing. Most, if they know anything, have found out what they have been told to manipulate them into certain actions. I recently received from the Ministry of Defense of a foreign government in Europe a document. And in this document, it explains how Eisenhower had a meeting in 1954 with extraterrestrial people and that he wanted to disclose their presence and bring out this information and technologies. Within six months of that, if you go back and look through all the aerospace journals, all references to anti-gravity, these high-end electromagnetic systems disappear from open source literature. Not a coincidence. What Eisenhower warned us about, the military-industrial complex, overtook and trumped his power. And it was during his watch 
that we lost control of this issue, sadly, to this day. By the time Jack Kennedy came along, Kennedy wanted to deal with it, and he was furious that he was being denied the controls. He knew about it, and we have a witness who was with him flying in where he was briefed specifically on this issue. And in this interview, this uh, colonel says, you know, the president said that he knew this was true, that we were being visited, but the whole matter was out of his hands, and he didn't know why. And then this man, an older colonel, Air Force guy, breaks into tears. He ran Air Force One for Jack Kennedy. That was in June of 1963, and he was dead in November. We have a document where it pretty well establishes that Marilyn Monroe was killed because she was going to tell the media what she knew about this. And this angered the Kennedys quite a bit. She was on the phone calling Bobby Kennedy, and this is in our book, Disclosure, as well as ET Contact. And in this document, it's interesting, it has all the correct project code names and code numbers for that era. Project Moondust, Project 46, I'll give you a more current one, 3452, if you know people in that compartment. And essentially, Marilyn didn't know what she was dealing with. So Marilyn Monroe was threatening in these phone calls to call up the media and tell the world what Jack Kennedy had told her in Pillow Talk, that we're not alone and that he had seen the bodies and the materiel, but that he didn't have control of the matter. The document specifically references the crash in New Mexico in the 1940s, specifically. And it's a top secret document that's not been declassified that was given to me by a gentleman whose family's been connected into the National Security Agency for many years. And then we go into the 70s. Nixon wanted to do this, but Nixon had been president of the Space Council for Eisenhower and was one of the people who had actually worked behind the scenes in a Machiavellian maneuver to betray Eisenhower. But when he became the president of the United States, he says, now I'll do this. And they said, they, this committee, said, no, you won't. And he had a tape prepared where he was going to disclose this information and then a young reporter with the Washington Post, who happened to have just arrived from the Office of Naval Intelligence, this is a matter of open source information, named Bob Woodard, managed to have this deep throat who gave all this information that resulted in his impeachment. The impeachment of the president. Bob Woodard, if, if you remember the Watergate event? Okay. Stay with me, buddy. We're going to go fast. <laughs> and then, of course, we have other presidents, briefly, Ford. He was interested in this. He's the one who held the committee hearings from Michigan when he was a congressman. And one of the guys who was in charge of being sure that nothing substantial was brought before that committee was a man named Donald Rumsfeld. True, I have the documents to prove it. Interestingly, after Ford, and we had, of course, the Carter administration, and you've heard from Daniel Sheehan and others what happened there, and I have other information. One of Carter's good friends is a man I work with very closely. And Carter basically was eventually told, sir, if you'd like to complete your first term as president, you will keep your mouth shut about this matter. And he did. Reagan, conveniently, was told just enough to get his support for SDI. He did know about the matter, absolutely. Uh, he was only given the information that was convenient and here's an inconvenient truth. The inconvenient truth is, is that if you're the President of the United States or the Chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, you're going to be told exactly what they want you to know, if anything. It'll range from nothing to some version of disinformation coded in information so that you do what they want you to do. The name of the game is disinformation and manipulating people. By the time Clinton came along, 
we'll just skip Papa Bush because he's a mid-level apparatchik in this uh, committee. Um, well, he was. I mean, he's the one who told Carter, a CIA director, outgoing CIA director, I'm not going to tell you anything about this. You know that story. So, essentially, President Clinton was a fresh face. He wanted to know, and he asked, of course, Webster Hubble to look into it at Justice, who was told basically a pack of lies, and asked some other people. And then I got all involved in putting together materials and briefing materials and had this long meeting with Clinton's first CIA director, R. James Woolsey. But the bottom line was, is that one of Clinton's friends, who was a political operative from Minnesota, came to my home after I spent all this time putting this together for the president and said, well, you know what? They really think this is a great idea. Fully supportive of what you're recommending. Disclosure, making open, peaceful contact with the visitors, bringing out the information and technology systems, etc. But they're convinced that if Clinton does this, he'll end up like Jack Kennedy. And I burst out laughing. I'm not kidding. This is in 1994. <laughs> he stops me. And I'm sitting at the table with my four daughters, God bless them, and my wife at our home. As a, you know, here I am, a country doctor in North Carolina, rattling around in an emergency department, taking care of shootings and stabbings, and got involved with all this for reasons you'll hear about in a moment. And I'm thinking, this guy's got to be joking. I mean, and he said, but they think you should do this. I go, what are you talking about? Why? And then I realized, I'm chopped liver, you know? I'm expendable. This is, this is not the main entree here. So they basically said that. The president won't do it. It's too risky. You can do it. And I went, oh, come on. You know, I'm working whatever sometimes 100 hours a week in an emergency department with 30,000 people a year coming through there. Last thing I need to do is take on this crap. <laughs> like a hole in the head. Well, I did anyway. I'm a sucker for causes that need to be done. And so I decided, you know what, we'll do it. But then we turned to members of Congress. And members of Congress were very interested. I briefed uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee members, for example, Dick Bryan, who was Democrat Senate Intel back in the 90s, and whose home state, by the way, is Nevada, like, you know, S4, S9, S12, Area 51, nobody calls it that. And he said, well, I have no doubt this is true, but they won't tell us anything about it. What do you want me to do about it? I said, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do about it. I want you to hold a hearing, and I have several hundred top secret military and intelligence witnesses who under oath will testify about what they have seen and what they know about this. And he just turned white. And his aide, who was sitting on a couch, who was just sort of ignoring the conversation, dropped his newspaper and had this expression like a far side cartoon, like this. <laughs> And I, he said, but I'm just, a, well, I'm just a senator from Nevada. And I said, no, I'm just a country doctor from North Carolina. That's become my line. And I said, sir, you've taken an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, and it is your sworn duty, since I have given you dispositive proof that this is going on, and that our commander-in-chief is being lied to, and his CIA director, and his Secretary of Defense, Cohen, who, for I know for a fact, because Gordon Cooper told me this, he personally was given materials by Gordon Cooper about his event and the details of the photographs and a film that Gordon Cooper's team took of one of these objects landing on a dry lake bed in California in 1950, 56, I believe it was. And if you're not being told, and you're on the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, this constitutes an illegal rogue group. And it is your constitutional obligation to look into it. He says, well, I really don't think I can do that. But have you talked to Senator Warner of Virginia? I said, yes, but he's part of the cabal. He says, ugh. Ouch. I'm dropping a few things that you're not supposed to know. So the bottom line was, and of course, fast forward to a few months ago, <clears throat> I'm doing a meeting in uh, Toronto, great guys in Toronto and in Canada helping with all this, uh, big beacons of light offshore also overseas. We'll talk about this in a moment. 
And uh, there was a minister of defense named uh, Paul Hellyer, former minister of defense, and we were talking, and he said, you know, as minister of defense, they never told me about this either. I know now it exists. And contrary to what the disinformation uh, blah, blah people who are out there, he didn't get involved with this because of just the book on Roswell. He had an, uh, an Air Force general who told him specifically that that was true and more. And so he knew this guy because he had known him during his MOD days as Minister of Defense in Canada. And what's interesting is that he said publicly that there are two governments. There's the government we elect and appoint, and there's this permanent government. And there aren't a lot of points of intersection between the two. Some. I'm giving you a few of them that have existed historically. It's a very dysfunctional situation. Why? You know, when I met with uh, the CI director, Woolsey, we spent 10 minutes on the evidence. 10. Count them. 10 minutes. I brought this whole portfolio of stuff. Witness testimony, photographs, government documents, the whole gamish. He says, I know they exist. I want to know why the hell they're not telling me anything. I'm the CIA director. I said, oh, well, the why is always a more difficult answer. Providing dispositive proof that we're not alone isn't difficult. We have it out there. Anyone who can read the King's English or any other language can see it. The question is, why has it been managed this way? That's what I want to talk about. Because in the why is also the solution. If you understand the why, you understand the method to our madness and how we've been doing this. Initially, there was just a lot of confusion. They didn't know what they were dealing with. And the military response to anything they don't understand and control is to kill it. Control it. I don't know what it is, so I want to control it. I asked a Navy intelligence guy who was uh, personally involved in a lot of the deceptive indications and warnings, false indications and warnings. This is called false flags in, in the pop culture now. But in the military, the Pentagon, they're called false INDs. And, and including setting up the whole abduction nexus and the mutilation nexus and the fear-mongering stuff and all this. And he said, yeah, well, we need people to support the future war in space because we have weapon systems up there and eventually we're going to need the public to support that program. I said, what are you doing? He says, we've been targeting these, these objects for 60 years. I said, why? He says, well, he says, it's just simple. It's like two dogs peeing on a post. They're marking their territory, and their attitude is, Earth is our territory, space or wherever you're from is yours, and if you come in here, we're going to hit you. And you need to know that the electromagnetic breakthroughs of Nikola Tesla and others that existed in 1900 and 1920 and 1930 were fully operational by 1947. Anyone who thinks that an extraterrestrial interstellar vehicle comes to interstellar space and loses its way over New Mexico and in Roswell and crashes, no, 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 no. This was an electromagnetic hit. And there's a government document, uh, agent writing to J. Edgar Hoover that we have, where he's describing a special new radar system, euphemism, electromagnetic scalar longitudinal weapon, that we use to knock that thing down. Two of them, in fact, went down. This is a dangerous situation, up to the point that recently we have acquired, through an institute we're working with in another country, the material, genetic, of an extraterrestrial biological life form that was the result of one of these Star War hits. As you know, we have disclosure project witnesses who describe on the Bolivian Peruvian border stations that look like telescopes targeting space, but what they're really doing is looking for these ET vehicles. They don't call them UFOs, it's ETVs. And as they come in, hit them with these electromagnetic weapons and not 100% of the time, but with enough that it's become very dangerous, can disable them. The one that crashed was an egg-shaped craft, probably 15 feet or so across, not that large. But these ET beings are only 60 centimeter 
in, in height. This, they're 60 centimeters is the height of the adults. And the, the child that we have, and you should see the video and photographs of this when this comes out, I, I'm not at liberty to release them yet, is only six inches. Be a beautiful being. Has uh, four skull bones. Um, is um, unusual in, in all of its characteristics. And you have to wonder, why are we having to do this? Who's controlling the trigger? It isn't the President of the United States, and it's not the Congress. There is an out-of-control, rogue kleptocracy that is doing this, and it is a threat to the national security of the United States and of the world. What we are at the, in the process of doing is providing that information. A few weeks ago, I was meeting with a man who's running for the presidency of the United States for one of the major political parties, and I had this conversation, and he knew, because we'd been briefing him for a while, on the fact that we weren't alone. He did not know that there were fully operational space-based weapon systems. He says, well, how long have these been operating? I said, in space? He said, yes. I said, since 1965 that I can establish through first-hand witnesses who had worked with Hughes and a few other corporations back then. He says, oh my God, is it that far out of control? I said, and worse. I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, well, if I become president of the United States, I said, sir, you're on this committee of the Congress. Let's do it now. Oh, no. Can't do it now. Can't do it now. And Paul Hellyer, when he met with a senior Canadian Congress a Parliament member had the same thing said to him. He said, basically, he said, Mr. Hellyer, you're asking me to reel in a 2,000-pound whale, and I've got a five-pound line. I can't do it. So our political leadership, almost uniformly, has either been intimidated, co-opted, or has opted out. And in that vacuum has stepped folks who have not managed this very well. Neither the relationship with our visitors, nor the secrecy. And now, half of them, half of them want it out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. You can't imagine that I would have gotten this far if there not had been very powerful interests within that group who want us to do this. It's not unanimous. But there's a Mexican standoff, to use a term. And there's a window. And that window will not be open forever. And I suggest we move through it expeditiously. To wit, I have been recently approached by a major government in Europe. And they have asked CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and you can see what we're doing at csetiorg C-S-E-T-I.org, to head up an effort to make open contact with these visitors so that there can be a proximal, meaning immediate, disclosure following that event. It would be the whole world watching. They know how dangerous the secrecy is. They are fed up with it. And the whole European axis is in a process of defecting. This is why, in the United Kingdom, they found these eight or 9,000 uh, cases uh, of, of top secret documents that they're now releasing. That's why the French Space Agency, CNES, has released 100,000 pages of previously classified material. That's why there are even senior officials at the Vatican who are saying, it's time, let's bring this out. James Jesus Angleton, yeah, so it's time. Now what's exciting about it, but also kind of risky, is that it's not 100% consensus. And this rogue international group can be rather nasty. And we know this is not without its risks. I mean, we may be out at this place making a contact event happen, like we were just recently at Mount Shasta and, and in Colorado, where we had craft come right in and hover over and take off and all this. You want to join us, we do these several times a year around the world to train you to be an ambassador to the universe. But now we're talking about a head of state being present of a nuclear power with the support of their entire Air Force and Ministry of Defense and the top scientists of that country in an event 
where there would be a landing and meeting between these visitors that our group has had contact with and I've had contact with since I was eight years of age. And that that would be followed immediately by a global announcement. We need your hopes and your thoughts and your prayers with us as this moves forward because it's imminent. What we're working on with this is imminent. And there are risks. And at this point, this head of state is still reviewing the protocols and considering to go or no go. If it's a go, it'll be out of the office of the head of state of this country. Because it's been taken out of the hands of just the Ministry of Defense. It would be the first open contact between these visitors and an organized, legitimate government in the world since Eisenhower had his meeting in 1954. And I was told by a senior person at this Ministry of Defense, you should see the documents about this event. Someday they'll be really amazingly historic, and I wish I could give them to you now. I'm not permitted to. But they talk about making a long-term commitment on this journey together into this interstellar contact. It's beautiful, the vision behind it. And guess what? They've been looking to us for the leadership to do this. And 15 years ago, when I started this effort, I said, you know, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. And that's what's happening. So don't think that you have no power in all this. You really hold the key. Because half of this kleptocracy that's been sitting on all this information and technologies are now wanting this to happen. The other half probably want them to go away. And there's a window open. And if we move forward decisively on contact, peaceful initiatives, and bringing out the sciences and technologies that we're identifying outside the classified world, I think we can make it happen. We created the vehicle to move it we now have to have the whole masses of the public behind it. Because remember, this secrecy has benefited a very small percentage of the world's population. I guess if you own a trillion dollar oil field, or a major transnational corporation, or the entire financial system, and you're in control of printing, the pr printing presses out there that print money, which is what this, a lot of it's about, this is not the best news. Why? Because the secrecy has to do about a couple of key points. One is that if the truth were known that we're not alone, some of the orthodoxy of fundamentalist and particularly eschatological belief systems would collapse. I was told specifically by a senior scientist at Jet Propulsion Laboratory that in fact there were ancient structures, not only on Moon but on, on Mars and that they were of an extraterrestrial civilization, and they did have a connection to early Earth civilization. But that if this were disclosed, certain fundamentalist and orthodox belief systems around the world would collapse. And that's true. And you know what I said to him? Good! <laughs> it's time. This is childhood's end. Let's move on. You know. Anyone who thinks the world's 6,000 years old, do you really need to make policy for them? <laughs> I'm sorry, please. <laughs> Jeez, you know, they're galactically brain dead. Now, the other issue has to do with power. Now, let me talk about this for a moment, because it's not about, you know, people think it's money, because obviously the propulsion system behind these things that you've seen, they're not using Exxon Jet A fuel, I can assure you or solid rocket boosters, or anything like that. They're using what we know has been developed for decades within the classified world, and actually way precedes the modern UFO era of the 1940s. Nikola Tesla and his coterie and colleagues at that time had electromagnetic systems that were over unity or free energy that would run this building. But J.P. Morgan and old man Westinghouse didn't want it out then. It's the same game. Nothing's changed in 100 years. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Because what we're talking about here 
our energy and propulsion systems, something that thought would fit on this pedestal, that would run your home or your car, and would extract energy from the so-called flux field, the electromagnetic flux field that's in the space around us. And it's estimated that every cubic centimeter of space in this room has enough energy to run the Earth for one day, meaning that it'd be like taking a thimble of water out of the Great Lakes. It'd be it's trivial, and it's constantly replenished. How do you think the original hydrogen atoms from the Big Bang, if you believe in that theory, I'm not so sure, but say it's 13 to 15 billion years old, how is that hydrogen atom still running? How are those subatomic particles still moving? What is the engine at that level? Is what we're talking about. And it's not about nuclear power, it's about the power of the quantum vacuum, the potential within space right here, not outer space, but the space of this room. And this started to be discovered in the late 1800s and early 1900s by people like Faraday, Tesla, and others. Stubblefield, who made the Earth battery. I have a picture of Stubblefield with Tesla in 1902 after they demonstrated this in Washington. 1902, 105 years ago. Before anybody in this room, I suspect, <laughs> right? You have to ask the question then, why do we still get 57% of our electricity from coal-fired power plants? And why are we still burning oil in our cars? And why do we have these things called nuclear power plants? Because they're all centralized systems of delivering the power that runs the world. And the gatekeepers of that benefit tremendously by that system. And if you bring out a technology which the UFOs prove exists, that enables energy to be drawn in from the space around it to go even interstellar. You wouldn't need oil and gas and coal or the centralized economic system as we know it today. Moreover, your geopolitical power is derived not by how many people you have. If that were the case, India and China would be the most powerful countries in the world, and they are not. It is derived from your economic prowess and technological ability and all the resulting benefits thereof. So Europe and America, with 600 million people, pretty much run the world's geopolitical situation, even though there are only one in 10 people on the Earth. But what happens when in India, every village has the means for clean energy, free energy, Electrification, transportation, refrigeration, manufacture, no pollution, no grid, no delivery costs, no fuel costs. Bam! You have a world where this is the tide that will lift all, lift all ships. But not just the ships of America and Europe and the Great White Father, but of the entire world and all of humanity will be lifted up with this knowledge. And when that happens, we will actually have to share power and consensus building with the peoples of the world, which right now we can pretty much strong arm aside. This is about geopolitical power on a large scale. Not about money the way you and I think of it. Money to me, you know, I've got a daughter at Yale, a daughter going to Stanford Law School, a daughter at UCSF getting her PhD in genetics, and one going to college now to be a teacher. I have four kids in college at various levels. You know, money to me is being able to keep that whole thing moving. No small feat to that. The tuition bill for Stanford alone is 38000 a year. But anyway, the, the point being, that's how we think of money. For these folks, it's really about power. Their currency is power and secret power. Because if from behind the scenes, they can be pulling all the switches Sort of like the Wizard of Oz, you know, you pull the curtain back and here's this old man. Well, that's really what's been going on. And the President of the United States, the current one and past ones, have known little to nothing about this because of plausible deniability. If it was known, good people would work to have it disclosed. Because you look at the suffering in the world. Do you know that half of the world lives on less than $2 a day? 
There's enormous poverty in the world, billions of people, mind-numbing poverty. This cannot be corrected with the zero-sum game of coal and gas and, 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 and nuclear power. Cannot be. Moreover, in the next 10 years, there are going to be 650 coal-fired power plants put online in China and India alone. That by itself will double the current greenhouse gases. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. We do not have a sustainable civilization here. We have one that is approaching V1 and may already be at V1. V1, Victor 1, is when you're going down the runway and if you don't rotate and go up, you've got to shut those engines down because you're out of runway. Our civilization is just out of runway. There's no time to phase this in gradually. That would have been 1900. Difficult would have been 1950. 2007, this is a Promethean task now. It's a Promethean task. And we need everyone to help with this effort because we are at the point now in our civilization that without bringing out these solutions, there can be no future. And it can only be done within the context of not just world peace, but universal peace. What a disaster to trade international conflict for interplanetary war, which is what Douglas MacArthur said to the Congress in his last address to Congress. He said, World War III will be interplanetary. This is a quote. And that's what's been planned since the 60s and late 50s. And I am here to ask all of you to consider something very serious. And that is, these visitors are not here because they are hostile, nor are they here to be entertained. They are concerned deeply about our ability to go into space with weapon systems to destroy this planet with which they may have had an ancient, if not basic, connection from the earliest days, earliest dawn of history. And they are here to help and understand, but they're not going to do it for us. We're going to have to do it. Have no illusions that they're going to land on the White House lawn and say, here we are. That's already been done. They landed in and met with President Eisenhower. They have flown over the Capitol. We have photographs of them. And what they've gotten in exchange is they've been shot at, denied, and defamed. Sometimes I feel like I'm a one-man anti-defamation league for extraterrestrials. <laughs> There's so much fearsome information out there. And the main entry point of this to the public is the media, Hollywood, and regrettably, the UFO subculture. I think we have to think very seriously about what we're doing. We're playing with something here, dealing with something extremely sensitive. And much of the information that's out there about this issue is very fearsome. And it redounds to only one agenda, and that is the establishment of conflict. Even if you feel there's one extraterrestrial race that's bad, and they're here for the wrong reasons, if that is what we decide as a people, then that will be the entry point for this military-industrial complex to say, yes, but we've got the solution. Let's unite the world, like the movie Independence Day, and let's kick alien butt. You remember the movie when Will Smith says that? That's a script. That's a script running. And this is a very dangerous script, because most of the people, if you go, I've given talks in kindergartners, and they say to me, well, aren't you afraid they're going to come and hurt you and take you out? I mean, there's all this fear. It's, it's seeped into the entirety of our subculture. And in that nexus of fear, enormous control is being exercised and will be exercised in the future. God help us if this disclosure events of the future and the contact that will be happening in the future gets put into that crab pot of stinking mythology and fear. Because if it does, we're all headed into something way past DEFCON 5. DEFCON 5 is nuclear launch, global. This is a very serious issue that we need to think deeply about. Who benefits from the fear that's put out there about these visitors? Well, 
some booksellers and some media people. The big beneficiaries are the military industrial complex and those who would like to see the world united around fear. What C. SETI has done is for 17 years is to go out all over the world and establish protocols to contact these visitors. And we have. And we have never been frightened, and we have never been threatened, and we've never been harmed. On the other hand, I have numerous military witnesses who have worked in underground facilities where little things that look like the grays are grown and are genetic experiments by humans and have been put on ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles made by Lockheed Northrop and a few other companies, and have been used to scare the bejeebies out of people. Yes, this truth is stranger than any fiction you'll ever read. I had a man, after I gave a talk in Salt Lake City recently, came up to me, waited for hours trying to get to me. He says, do you know, and he had been in one of the facilities out in Utah, that these things a lot of people are describing are actually man-made, that we've been growing them? I said, oh, yes, of course. You're talking about the PLFs, program life forms. I said, yes, of course. Everyone knows that who studied this with any assiduous due diligence. Anything beyond just a superficial sort of teleologic level of investigation. And he said, oh, thank God. And then he disappeared. But he didn't want to be identified. Do not let all the fear overtake your senses. You know, we have to be open-minded, but not so open-minded our brains fall out onto the floor. So, <laughs> and so there has to be a certain amount of discernment here. And more importantly, even if you were to take all those myths and accounts at face value, that there's nothing else going on behind it, even though there's a huge amount of information about military abductions and military mutilations and military-related simulating. I call it the faux contact events, F-A-U-X. It's a false flag operation. It's been running since the 40s and 50s. Even if you take it all at face values, there's only one proper response that's survivable to these visitors, and that is an open, peaceful, diplomatic, response. If you think that there's going to be a solution that's military and that involves conflict in this sort of false dialectic that's been created, you're sadly mistaken because the technologies that enable you to travel through interstellar distances would make a hydrogen bomb look like a tinker toy. It's not an option. There's one possible future. You analyze it all and that's universal peace open contact, disclosure, putting the best in front of ourselves and manifesting that good future. That's the only possible future. And that's what we need to share with each other and combine our forces to manifest. And it's what we need to tell our leaders when we meet with them. When I was a young youngster, I mean, as I had some very interesting things happen to me. And I want to share this for just a moment. In this new book I have, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, I talk about this, and I talk about my experiences over the last 45 years of my life or so. But when I was eight years old, I saw one of these beautiful ET craft, a seamless object that appeared and where I was growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina. It turns out there was a Douglas missile plant not far from there, and I think they were checking out what was going on. It was a nuclear facility then. And it appeared, and it didn't move off. It just vanished. It dematerialized right in front of us. And I went, oh, they do exist. Deep in my soul, I knew we weren't alone in the universe. And I always would look up at the stars and go, how beautiful. And I started after that having some really interesting contact with some of these beings in the lucid dream state. Now, let me explain what this is. Why is this important? We're, I don't know if you want to get into the weird stuff. We're getting the weird stuff. Let's go. All right, here you go. This is the really good stuff. I'm giving you the red pill now. <laughs> if you put a, 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 a certain electromagnetically generated resonance field around this, you can cause this to, to disappear. You take it out of its current spin, as it were. It's still there, but you don't see it. Where is it? Well, it hasn't disappeared. 
The word dematerialize is really not a correct term either. Its resonance field has shifted through harmonics, and we'll get into this with these energy systems, where this can be, it's disappeared, but it's still there, but where is it? Well, some would say it's in another dimension. Well, you can use that terminology, but it's not really correct, because folded within space and time right here is every level of every dimension, which are infinite in their differentiation. There is no cessation to them. Ironically, every point in space and time is intimately locatable to every other point in space and time through the integrating aspect of pure conscious intelligence. And this is how technologies who are developed, which are developed enough to go through interstellar space can interface with three-dimensional reality and three-dimensional people. When you have a lucid dream experience, you know what I mean? You're awake in the dream and you're kind of, how many people have had a flying dream experience? I just had one recently, it was fabulous. I was in Europe over this great city where this head of state is, and I was visiting him and his... Anyway, I do this kind of stuff at night. Maybe visit you. Watch out. Ah! Well, my wife and I had an anniversary in August a few years ago in the 90s, and we went to Costa Rica, and we were on the coast, the Pacific coast. And that night, I recount this in the book, I went to sleep, and I had this wonderful lucid dream where I was flying over the edge of the coastline. And during the, with the astral celestial vision of consciousness, it was like it was daytime, but everything had a light of its own, even though it was nighttime. It was beautiful. And the water with that blue aqua color and the green trees, and it was like flying through a heaven, but it was earth. My wife... God bless her, woke up at the instant this dream started. And she saw this silvery gray form sit up out of my body and fly out the window. And she's thinking, Umbashreen. <laughs> and she's Jewish. Umbashreen. I've got this husband who's now dead. She thought I died. <laughs> and four kids at home with a nanny. And she really thought I had died. But then she noticed I was still kind of lightly breathing. And then I came back and the dream ended. And to me, it was a, quote, dream, which we discount as being important. They're not. When I came back, I felt someone looking at me. I looked over and there she was and her eyes were like saucer. She says, you're back. I said, back? Where have I been? I didn't go anywhere. She says, oh, you did. I saw you lift up and fly out the window. I said, oh. So we're there having this discussion, as a, okay. Um, and she did see that. And so you're in that lucid dream state. These extraterrestrial people have as easy a contact with you as we would have with a cell phone. Why? Why? I talked to a scientist who worked for years with the old man McDonald at McDonald Douglas. And one of the things they were looking into are these black boxes and devices that have been seen with the ETs when people have had contact and where these things have spoken in their minds. They've heard them in their minds. Even though they may be making some sound as a person. And he and I were talking about that. I said, well, of course it makes total sense. The best way to travel is thinking. The Moody Blues were right. But what does that mean? It means that any spacecraft and any extraterrestrial life form that goes beyond the speed of light shifts into this field of energy, which the mystics would call etheric or astral. And that is the form they're in. And they could be in this room. And unless you had an NRO neutrino light detector, you wouldn't know it. National Reconnaissance Office has detectors that will pick up some of that. Extraterrestrial civilizations that are interstellar, and that's all of them, they're not from Mars, and they're not from Jupiter. They may have facilities out there. And I have a guy at Lockheed Martin who was imaging one of the huge craft out over Saturn during the recent Cassini event probe. They, when they hit this button, as it were, there's a resonance field frequency shift and they appear to the naked eye to disappear, but they're still there. 
They could be hovering or they could be going through interstellar space. But they're not going through linear space-time. They're bypassing linear space-time and going from point to point like this. Communication is instant. Actual craft traveling may take a month or a week. Who knows? There's a variable. There's a coefficient of drag as you skim along under the uh, etheric energy field of the linear space-time universe. Get what I'm talking about? Yeah? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, <clears throat> there is a coefficient. It gets into a lot of physics. I I'm not a physicist. I'm a country doctor who lives in Virginia now, but <laughs> out near Charlottesville. But I will tell you that understanding this is very, very important. Because what we have found is that these civilizations understand this as well as you and I understand how to click on a light switch. They have to. Otherwise, they couldn't be here. And so we have got to understand something very profound, and that is the power of mind, thought, consciousness. What is it? Well, I was raised a very devout atheist. And... Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> My parents were actually Unitarian and very kind of a more libertarian in their view and what have you, but I, I was told nothing existed that you couldn't put in a test tube and what have you. And many of you know that my maternal uncle was the senior project engineer who built the lunar module that took Neil Armstrong to the moon. And yes, we did land there. It's just that you weren't shown what happened when we did. Um, that's another discussion. But what's interesting is that when you look at the sciences, of consciousness. That is the key to understanding how extraterrestrial civilizations are communicating, how they appear, how they vanish, what have you. Now I know this sounds a little wishy-washy to some people who are kind of hardcore linear scientists, or, but you have to consider this. What happens when you go beyond the speed of light? What are you? You cannot stay in this form. You're not. And where have you shifted to? You're intimately connected at that point to what the mystics would have called the field of conscious thought, that realm. Now, it's a little more differentiated than just thought. It's not as fine as thought, but it's that stuff. And communication, absolutely. All of their communication systems are consciousness interface. Because these ETs, when they're in their vehicles, they're connecting to it, and their mind is connected to the craft, and there is a bio-electromagnetic field and conscious thought field connected into the guidance system. Absolutely. Everyone who studied this back to old man McDonald and McDonald Douglas knew this. Well, if you understand that, you can then understand how you can make contact. You see, the total number of minds in the universe is one. Erwin Schrodinger said that in the early part of the 1900s, father of modern quantum mechanics, actually particle wave theory. And the truth about the nature of consciousness, and I know this is a conversation I've had with Edgar Mitchell and a few other people, is that it really is a quantum hologram. It's a non-local field of awareness. And that's the nature of the mind wherewith I am awake right now and whereby you are conscious at this instant. We think that it's her consciousness, his consciousness, her consciousness. No. There's one pure, awake mind being phasing and shining through the individuality, if you will, of every individual. But the mind itself is a singularity. And this has been proven scientifically. That's why Dr. John was doing all this work at the Peer Lab at Princeton. When I spoke to him about what we were doing out in the field where C-City goes out to make contact, he says, well, you're doing out in the universe what we've been proving in the lab. I said, absolutely. Except we're adding another dimension. And we're saying now we have to be ambassadors to the universe because our leaders have failed to lead. And you have to do it understanding that consciousness is a singularity that thought can be coherently organized to not only remotely view deep space, I was just with Russell Targ out in California recently, but also to contact and vector them in. We have a meditation CD out there you can get where you can learn to do this. Do it on your own. You'll be surprised who will show up. Don't do it unless you're ready. It works, absolutely. And they may appear 
fully materialize. It may be in a orb type event. It may be some electromagnetic anomaly. It may be in consciousness and thought. It may be in the dream state, all of the above. Why? Because this spectrum of reality that ranges from the field of the absolute in the unbounded mind all the way to physical three-dimensional matter and space-time is a single continuous resonance field. And it just depends on how you want to turn the dial, this way or that. See it? Feel it? You can turn it any way you want to. Now, this brings up another issue. And that is, how do we talk about this to people who are CIA directors? And the <laughs> well, you just do. I learned a lesson. It was a hard lesson. And on December 13th of 1993, and you've heard of some of what Rockefeller was trying to do, and separately we were making our own initiatives. And when I was meeting with the CIA director, the cover story for that meeting was a dinner party at this townhouse over in Arlington. And the guy hosting it, imagine this, doesn't even tell his wife till that day who's coming for dinner. Guess what, honey? Guess who's coming for dinner? Who? Oh. oh, well, the CIA director and this guy, Dr. Greer, who's an uh, expert on extraterrestrials, and goes, oh, poor lady. Anyway, she was very gracious. And we had a lovely meeting. And all this discussion went forward. And we talked about why the secrecy existed and why they wouldn't really tell the president about it or his CIA director and why Cohen, Secretary of Defense, Cohen was being blocked. Because they were in favor of disclosure and they didn't want to go along with the secrecy. They tell you if you're in favor of the secrecy. It's simple. But at one point, his wife who was there, now this sounds, sounds terrible, but because it, the cover story for this was a dinner party, which later, subsequently, that's all they said it was, which is a lie. You know, a lot of these folks, how do you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. <laughs> uh, but when we had this discussion, it, it, the CIA director's wife, Dr. Woolsey, Sue Woolsey, was the uh, chief operating officer of the National Academy of Sciences. And she asked me, how are these craft and these civilizations communicating through interstellar distances? And I went, oh God, do I tell her some namby-pamby thing that would sound good to a physicist? Or do I tell her the truth and lose all my credibility? I said, well, you know what? This was a, a sort of a coming to Jesus moment, as we say in the South. I had to decide. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. Uh, I had to decide whether to tell her the truth or make up a fiction. And I said, I'm going to tell her the truth. So I told her, look. This universe, if you take the galaxy, the Milky Way, our home galaxy that has our sun with our planets and then billions of other star systems, it's about 100,000 light years across. That's the distance a beam of light travels in 100,000 years at 186,000 miles every second. 186,000 miles a second for 100,000 years. That's just our galaxy. It's just one of billions of galaxies. So the speed of light is too damn slow. Forget AT&T. Ain't going to happen. And forget Exxon Jet A fuel. Ain't going to happen. Ain't never going to happen. Just as simple. So what has happened is that they are using technologies that interface with thought and this resonant field of conscious intelligence and doing so to another node, another device, reliably. So it's instantaneous between any distance in space. Because even if a star system was a thousand light years away, one percent of the distance across the galaxy, if it was traveling at the speed of light for a signal, like the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, we're listening. Yeah. Right, whatever. <laughs> even our classified projects haven't used that nonsense for 60 years. The bottom line is, you're not going to be able to communicate in someone's lifetime at the speed of light. Because if you said, hi, how are you doing? Let's say you're an ET from a star system out there. For them to say, fine, how are you today? How long did that just take if you're a thousand light years away? Two thousand years, a time since the birth of Christ. To say, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. The speed of light isn't viable. So then you have to get into modulated technologies that deal with these resonant harmonic fields that go beyond, and they do. 
and they interface very directly. So ET civilizations have technologies that can not only pick that up in, as we project it, but can also use that as a guidance system. Now, how did I discover this little nugget? Well, this is a rather dis interesting story. I mentioned to you that I was raised a devout atheist, but something happened on the way to that catechism. <laughs> and that is when I was 17 years of age, I got very sick. And you know, teenage boys, you know, I was always sort of athletic and a jock, and I did this thing where I, I injured my left thigh. And there's a little piece of this muscle missing to this day. Not that little piece, but that big around. And it got infected. But I said, oh, it'll be fine. So I bicycled 200 miles in one day from Charlotte, North Carolina to one of the barrier islands. It spread all through me. Then I, oh, I was so sick. And I said, I got to get home. And at that time, I was living in my own apartment. I was in high school. I had to support myself. It's a long story. My childhood wasn't a pretty picture. But I went and bicycled 200 miles back on this. By the time I got back, I was so sick. I mean, really sick. But, you know, we don't have health care in this country. Uh, and so I didn't, I was poor, working at Red Lobster washing dishes uh, in a restaurant till one in the morning and going to school. And I was a straight-A student in Honor Society, and everyone thought I had money, but I was very poor. And I had this little apartment in this really kind of sketchy part of town, which now in Charlotte is actually quite expensive. But anyway, um, it's like Washington. Uh, and... I was really sick. I mean, I was, my urine was the color of Coca-Cola. And I realize now I was septic and had hepanorrhetal syndrome and I was having kidney failure and all the whole bit. Well, I basically crashed there in my little studio apartment and I had a near-death experience. And I went whoosh, whoosh, out. And I didn't go and meet anyone in a white robe. I basically had an experience in this state of universal consciousness. And I was out in deep space, out in the cosmos, and it was beautiful. And then I had these two scintillating beings. They were not anthropomorphic, and they weren't ET. They were high celestial beings that basically approached. And there was all this knowledge and, and perspective that was just poured into me. And eventually I was told I had a choice, either go with them or to return back. I came later to realize that these were two avatar-type beings. Very, very high, evolved, beautiful beings. And I said, I had enough sense to say, well, what do you want me to do? Well, you know, thy will be done. They said, we want you to go back to Earth. I said, oh, great. Back to that dust heap. <laughs> After this experience, because the experience was like being out in space, but being in a state where the, your, your mind, the awake mind whereby you were conscious, was this infinite, pure, field of awareness. And it was so joyful and so peaceful and so beautiful and so healing. Because when I came back, I spontaneously had this heal. Well, what this taught me was that there was more to existence than what you could put in a test tube and that everything was conscious. Because when I was out in deep space, I found that every star, every photon, every world was nothing but pure consciousness resonating and phasing as that thing. The state of unity, pure consciousness. It's a beautiful experience. And you'll all experience that someday if you haven't yet. All of you. Well, I came back and I thought, well, what am I going to do? I spontaneously had this problem healed. Never did see a doctor. Um, but I said, you know, I've got to learn how to do this meditation. So I went to a meditation course. And on my 18th birthday, June 28th of 1973, I went to this course. Uh, back then, everybody was doing this transcendental meditation stuff, you know. So I sat and I meditated, and I went right back into that state of unbounded mind. Because it was very fresh. That had happened in March. This was in June. And afterwards, about 20 minutes, the teacher looked over at me and said, you transcended, didn't you? I said, yes, isn't that what we're supposed to do? See, the nice, <laughs> the nice thing about being raised an atheist is that I didn't know you weren't supposed to be able to do this easily. And you can. And I was nothing special, believe me. I mean, lower than whatever. I'm just a very common person. So what 
the message in this was, don't listen to people who give you messages that you can't do things because you can't do them and they're hard or they're... You can. You know, as you have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. So, at this point, I began to practice this. And I went off to college, and I was up in the mountains of North Carolina, and I had this deep love for those mountains. And my, my grandma was Cherokee. My, my dad's half Cherokee. Um, my twin sister looks very Cherokee. And I was up there, and one day I decided to go up to this mountain called Rich's Mountain. And at the top of it was what the, the local people called a fire tower. Now, you'd call it a fire tower. But in North Carolina, they're called a... <laughs> we call those a far tower. So I, was hike... so I was hiking up to this far tower, and, uh... well, I mean, it's... A... And it was a beautiful day in October of 73. Yom Kippur War was going on. And I go up there to meditate where there's this fire tower. And as I'm getting up there, it's close to sunset, and this same spacecraft I saw when I was a child materialized, just appeared in the kind of west-southwest. And I went, oh, they're back. I didn't think anything more about it. And then they, it winked out, vanished. Beautiful, but it was very big, perfectly silvery sort of ship, shape like that. Well, I sat to meditate and went into this deep meditation and had this experience of cosmic awareness again. And afterwards, I was in a meditation so long, it got very dark and it was crystal clear. You could see the Milky Way galaxy. You know how it looks at night when you're up high. It's about 5,200 feet high up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. And I stood up and, a, and a, I was told, I mean, this, this thought came in very clearly, behold what a beautiful universe God has made. And with that, I went right back into that state I experienced in my near-death experience, except I was in my body now. Then I wondered, what's going on? And over beside me, I realized, was this person? And I don't know how tall he was, not as tall as I am. Um, I'm 6'4", maybe he was 5 feet, and touched me on my right shoulder. My ski jacket I had, it was cold up there that time of year, indented. And all the hair on my head just went And I used to have hair then, uh, and longer too. This is the 70s. And so, boom. And I went into this state, no, and I've never done any drugs. This was absolutely lucid. Uh, and I realized the craft was there on the edge of the mountain. It dropped off. And boom, like that, I was on this craft. And we co-created the CE5 initiative. If you know, you've heard of the CE5 initiative where we go out, go into this sort of group meditation, do the remote viewing, coherently see these craft, vector them into your location so you're out in space, you see the Earth, North America, East Coast, Washington, going west, Gaithersburg, this hotel, zip. And you stay in that state for several hours, continuous coherent thought sequencing, like a laser. So you know laser light is coherent light? This is thought that's coherent, resonating and phasing from this pure state of unbounded mind, because then you're non-local. How do you see another star system? You can go within and see it. And then they appear. And we have had this happen hundreds and thousands of times. After this was shown to me, I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I'm 18 years old, and I'm thinking, you got to be nuts. So I go to bed that, uh, the following night. By the way, I come back down from this thing, and I have this strange anti-gravity field around me where I can go from here to the, like where the dog is over there in one leap. It was like Moonwalker. It was weird. It was beautiful. It was almost levitating. But it was because I had this lightness. My physical body was very altered and stayed that way all the way till I got down the town, and then the town was empty. I thought the young Kemper Ward ended up in DEFCON 5, we'd gone the nuclear war, because I thought it was maybe 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. Turns out it was 12 or 1, very late, and I got locked out of the dorm. The whole thing back then, they had curfews. Well, I started practicing this, and then every night I would, there'd be all these sightings of these craft all over that part of the mountains of North Carolina. The rangers were reporting, it was all in the media, and I said, ooh, I wonder if that's... And so I stopped, and they'd stop. Then I'd do it again, and it'd start again. So then finally I said, you know, I shouldn't do this unless I have a good reason. And that was in 1973. 
But in 1975, I went off. I finally decided I wanted to become a meditation teacher. So in my misspent youth, when everybody else was doing drugs and chasing skirts, I was in learning to become a teacher of meditation. So I did that, and I was up in the Isola, the French Maritime Alps. And I was on this course, and I had some friends, one or two of whom knew I had had this kind of experience in my previous couple years. And so here I am two years later, and I'm sitting there, and I think one morning we're doing these things where we're spending six to eight hours a day in meditation. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try this and see if it works. So I did. So I go into this state, remote view, deep space, see the craft, see these beings, invite them to come, boom, and show them where I am up in the French Maritime Alps. Zip. Well, we go out after lunch and go walking in the mountains outside of the hotel in Isola. And I'm with a whole group of people. And all of a sudden, this gorgeous tetrahedral-shaped craft materializes in this crystal blue sky, one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, this is very clear. And it starts floating silently towards us, descending. But a friend of mine who was there, Marion de Sessa, an Italian, starts going, did you ask them to come? What are you doing? And she starts hitting me. She says, oh my God, I can't believe you did. I said, yeah, I did. She says, oh my God. So, she, so as soon as her fear factor went up to a certain level, it stopped. And then it, the difference between a, a me lab, a military abduction and contact, which is a pseudo contact, and the ET ones, is that the ETs stop as soon as there's any fear or concern. The military guys don't. Here they come. So it backed off and then vanished. And I went, oh, I guess that does work. And I continued to then do nothing until two years later. And then in the fall of 1977, I said, I'm going to try this again. And I was in the Blue Ridge Mountains back there, and I was teaching meditation and doing things, and I was actually going back to, to courses and, uh, in school. And I had a friend, and he and I shared the downstairs of this uh, house, and our bedrooms were beside each other. And so one night, I got this wild hair, and I said, let's do this again. So I did. In about two or three, and I don't know what time, late, maybe not that late, but very late at night, early morning, I'm awakened with this beautiful bluish aura of a ship about 40, 30, 40 feet outside our window with this light coming in, but more importantly, the intelligence and specific individuality of the ET being in the house, in the bedroom. I went, oh, they're back. Unfortunately, my housemate woke up and jumped up, came running in and said, do you see there's a spacecraft outside our window? I said, yes, I know. I asked them to come. He said, what are you doing? <laughs> Don't do this. You scared the bejeebies out of me. And with that, you know, because he, he could also sense that this being was in the house. You couldn't see it with the naked eye. You could see it with the celestial vision, but you could feel it. And the craft was completely materialized. So then we went out into the living room, and the craft comes around to the front side of the house. This is like something out close encounters with the third kind. And then it just goes over towards uh, Grandfather Mountain and goes, zzz, takes out into space and it's gone. Turns out that's the famous Snoopy police helicopter event that was on radar in Charlotte, North Carolina. Because when I was vectoring them in my childishness, I thought they needed directions. So I sent them first to where I was born and grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then brought them up to the mountains. And two of these craft were over Charlotte that evening, on radar, seen by Eastern Airline pilots and chased by the police helicopter. I have the FAA tape of this. And they were seen disappearing, going towards the Northwest Mountains. Could have been a coincidence. What does all this mean? It means that each of us have within us the entirety of our universe. Everyone thinks that we're just isolated. We're not. Every single human being and every sentient being in the universe has folded within them the ability to be awake, infinitely awake, see and know distant places, and to contact. And this is why each one of you can be ambassadors to these people. And I would suggest this. While I hope that the leaders in Europe who are now working with us on this project see it through, there's an expression when I lived in the Middle East, trust in God but tie your camel. <laughs> and I would suggest that we not wait 
that we continue to go forward and that each of you take it upon yourself to learn about this, to learn the techniques to do it, that you form a group of people where you live and that you be the face of humanity to these visitors, not a covert kleptocracy that is targeting them with electromagnetic warfare systems. They need to see you. They need to see the face of hope. They need to see the face of a future and the good that's within humanity. And we are that. We can do that. And I want each of you to know that all of you have that folded capacity within you. It is all within us. And if we do that, then our leaders will have to follow because they're going to know about it. Believe me, they know. The main reason I've had a lot of these meetings is because they know these contacts and events we've had are real. And that not only are they real, but that it's something that can bypass their whole system completely. We are inviting them to come along, but in the meanwhile, let us do it ourselves, including we need your help with these energy systems. We've now identified about a dozen built systems that we're in the process of evaluating that extract energy from the ambient space around them. And this is something that we need all your help because when we begin to disclose these systems, which I hope will be fairly soon, this is going to take on an enormous profile and risk. And you know what? All of us together and the masses of people are going to be the shield, the protective sheltering branch around which all this can happen. Open contact with the visitors, disclosure of the technologies for their peaceful generation of energy, and the complete transformation of our civilization. Because imagine this. Today we have a world that is so bereft of hope. Why? Because most people don't know that on the earth today is all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all the sciences and the technologies to establish a sustainable, peaceful civilization that will go on not for hundreds of years or thousands, but for hundreds of thousands of years until such time as every man, woman, and child on this planet are in a state of enlightenment and we are visiting other worlds, bringing them along from where we are today. That is our destiny. And I think all of you should take that on as your purpose and your calling. Thank you very much. I appreciate you.